Let's talk about double replacement reactions. Here's the essential question. This is what we're going to focus on with these set of notes. How do we recognize and finish double replacement reactions? Write this at the top of your page so you know what to look out for. Remember, double replacement reactions are just one of five classifications of reactions. So we're going to focus more in-depthly on double replacement reactions today to talk about how we can, from reactants, write the products of those types of reactions. A double replacement reaction is just a reaction where two compounds exchange their charged parts to form two new compounds. Here's an example of a compound, a very generalized form made of an A substance and a B substance. Notice that their charges are positive attached to a negative. Likewise, here's another compound made from C and D with a positive and negative charge, and that's how ionic compounds attach to each other. When these substances go through a double replacement reactions, they're going to exchange their partners, kind of like a, a couple of sets of dancers who want to switch their partnerships. In this case, A is going to go with D because they are oppositely charged from one another. And C is going to go with B, likewise, because they're oppositely charged from one another. Remember, opposite charges attract. There are two types of double replacement reactions we should watch out for. One of, is, one of them is a precipitation reaction. And I want to let you know that you've already seen these in a previous semester or in Chemistry 1 or Honors Chemistry 9. These types of reactions are driven by the formation of a precipitate, which is a solid product from a mixture of two aqueous solutions. The second type is called an acid-base neutralization reaction. These types of reactions are driven by the formation of water from a mixture of acid and base going through a double replacement reaction. Let's take a closer look at each type of reaction and have an example in practice. Let's start with a precipitation reaction. Now, full disclaimer, we're not going to expect you to know how to go through and use solubility rules um, for double replacement reactions, but we do want to remind you how it works and challenge you, challenge you to try to remember it. In this example at the top, we have lead 2 nitrate and potassium iodine, both going through a double replacement reaction. These are two aqueous solutions that are mixed. Now notice that they form two products. One of them is lead to iodine because lead, being a positive charge, will go and attach to its new partner iodine. Notice that it, we know that this is going to be our solid precipitate. This is what makes us a precipitation reaction. How do we know that? Well, the solubility rules on the periodic table help us determine that. Notice iodine right here is found in the soluble list on these solubility rules. Technically, things attached to iodine would be soluble. However, this is a special case because of lead. Lead is an exception to this rule, meaning that iodine, normally being soluble, becomes insoluble. And being insoluble means that it forms a solid precipitate. We can actually extract this snotty looking substance from the solution, dry it out, and we would have a solid powder. Now, the other part of our double replacement reaction is potassium nitrate. This is strictly an aqueous solution. It still dissolves because nitrate is always soluble according to these rules. See if you can pause this video and figure out the second practice yourself. Did you pause? Did you try it out? I hope so. That's the best way to learn is to try and, and learn and practice and see if you can correct your mistakes. All right, let me help you with this. Here we have two aqueous solutions. The first one is iron 2 sulfide. The reason we know what charge it is is because we can look on the periodic table. Sulfur is a minus 2 and iron being attached to it, only 1, is a positive 2. Here we have hydrochloric acid. Hydrogen and chlorine are each positive and negative one charge. This is going to be important when we do our double replacement reaction. I'm going to do so now and show you that the products look like this. And again, that's just based on their charges and their, the rule of zero charge in play. Iron 2 chloride, iron being a positive 2, chlorine being ne a negative 1, means that we need two chlorines over here in order to counteract the one chlorine over there. Likewise, hydrogen being a positive 1 and sulfur being a minus 2 means that we need two hydrogens for every sulfur. Now, you might notice that this reaction is not balanced. There's more hydrogens and chlorines on the right side of the reaction than are on the left. Therefore, I need to add a coefficient of 2 in front of the hydrochloric acid. Now, what about these phase symbols? Well, I'm going to use the solubility rules to determine what they are. Chlorine is soluble, and iron is not an exception to that. Sulfur, on the other hand, is insoluble, and hydrogen is not an exception to that. Therefore, this hydrogen sulfide is what determines this to be a precipitation double replacement reaction. The other type of double replacement reaction is an acid-base neutralization reaction. In this, take a look at the example above. We have an acid 
attaching itself to a base to form two products. One of them is a salt, which is sodium phosphate, and the other product is water, which is our driving force of this type of reaction. Now, this acid is found on a list of acids on our periodic tables. Typically, acids start with hydrogen, but we're going to get more in-depth on that later. This is a base, sodium hydroxide. Typically, bases have hydroxide in them, but again, we'll talk about that more in-depth later. Let's see if you can figure out this practice problem. This works very similar to the last type of reaction. Don't forget, or the last type of double replacement reaction, don't forget about charges. Did you pause the video and try it? Well, let me help you. Here is sodium hydroxide. Sodium is a positive one, and hydroxide, being a polyatomic ion, is a negative one. Here's sulfuric acid. I know that based on my periodic table, but I can know the charges again. Hydrogen is a positive one, and sulfate on the polyatomic ions list is a minus two. Based on those charges, these are the two products that they form. Sodium sulfate, following these charges, and then hydrogen hydroxide, following those charges. Now, you might recognize that hydrogen hydroxide is just water, but I want to teach you a little trick about balancing. One balancing tip is to keep water in the form of hydrogen and hydroxide. Notice on my left side of the my periodic table, one of my reactants has hydrogen in it and the other one has hydroxide in it. Keeping it in this form helps me figure out how to balance those two things without combining them. I can always go back and write it as water a little bit later. So keeping it as hydrogen and hydroxide, I can see that there are two hydrogens on the left, but only one on the right. And so I'm gonna go ahead and try to fix that. By putting a two here, I fix my hydrogens, but I kind of ruin my hydroxide. So I have to put a two over here as well. And that helps my sodiums, which are already a two. So this is a completely written, balanced, double replacement, acid-based neutralization reaction. That leads us to the end of our notes. Take some time to review and highlight key terms, ponder and ask questions, and summarize and answer the essential question. Good luck.